Hello, everybody, and welcome to another session of SEO's RAS webinar. Today, our guest is Gabor Papp. He is a head of SEO at the Pitch Agency, and he's going to talk about his framework for evaluating SEO progress and success and delivery of SEO activities. And he is also going to talk about uh, common questions that clients ask and how to answer them in terms of prediction of results and so on. So just to remind you, you can always ask Gabor and me questions at Slido. Just go to slido.com and enter SEO Zras event code and uh, you are free to ask questions. And Gabor's uh, presentation should take about, let's say 20, 25 minutes and after that, we'll have time to discuss your questions and also other things that you have on your mind. So Gabor, thank you for accepting and feel free to start. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Let me just quickly share my screen so you actually see what I see. Just to get feedback, Daniel, you're seeing my slides, right? It works, thanks. Perfect, so the title of the presentation is Predicting Your SEO Work and Success. Um, it's gonna be useful to many of you, um, but we'll discuss this um, at the end. Um, as the others discussed before, you can join us with the questions at Slido regarding the presentation or um, um, any other questions that you might have about the topic. So predicting your SEO work and success. The first question when it comes to my mind when a client or potential client asks me whether we can predict anything, um, my question is that, is it possible at all to predict this? And the answer is that predicting SEO success is hard, but not impossible. Let's break it down a little. When is it possible? It is possible when competition at a certain market is uh, fairly low, relatively low. And as the competition rises, the task will become much more difficult. We'll tackle this one um, in a few minutes. So it's possible to predict SEO success. Um, it's not gonna be 100% accurate, but if competition is very low, it's easy. It's much more easier uh, when uh, compared to when it's, uh, it's very competitive. So the question is, is it possible at all? My favorite SEO like comment or, um, or answer as uh, everybody puts it, it depends. Uh, and why does it depend? And uh, not just that it depends, but let's break it down into uh, smaller sections. This chart or this graph might look kind of silly or, or uh, I don't know, unprofessional to you, but it's it's very simple and it's very clear. And this is one of my favorite SEO slides ever. Um, it will show you like if uh, a site is getting bigger in size, technical elements usually matter a lot more and then content becomes less important. It's just like a general fact that if you work on a very large site, um, there will be a ton of technical SEO problems. It's not gonna be much about content, but rather about technical fixes and technical elements. Now, um, it is a simple uh, message, but the message is very clear. It's not a nice graph, but that's the beauty of it because it, will, it just captures something very fast and very easy. Now, let's try to understand and visualize SEO success the same way. How can we do that? And the analogy I used to, and I usually make is that SEO is like, um, is like a turntable or um, like a DJ mixing station because you have something right in front of you. And then there are like turns and twists and then and sliders. Um, and what you can do is just like kind of start playing with these. And if every single level is turned to the minimum or to zero, there's gonna be no sound. Or if the entire system is not hooked up correctly, there's gonna be no sound. And as you like turn and twist elements uh, and you raise the levels high enough, we'll cover this one, what this is, you'll actually start to hear music. It's not gonna be loud enough. It's not gonna be clear enough. It, you might have some echo, but you'll start to understand that this is the minimum level that I need to put like, let's say the TV on, so I would hear something. And later when you start hearing things, that's when you can start to fine tune and make it louder, make it sound better. 
And this is exactly how it works with SEO. You have to start getting the first few organic clicks. And once you have that one, you have to make it louder, make it bigger, fine tune it. So this is all good up until this point, but there is one very important slight distinction. With audio, there are fixed values and fixed levels you can settle for. Uh, but with SEO, these levels can change over time. Our job at the moment right now is to get a snapshot or a picture of the current market situation. Where is everybody at the moment we are trying to compete with? And this is how we will try to understand what we need to do to get better or to succeed in SEO. Let's get down to the basics. So SEO has uh, three big pillars, uh, technical SEO, on-page SEO, which is like content, and then off-page SEO, which is mostly links. And when we look at these three elements, tech, on-page, and off-page, uh, let's say there's like a scale from zero to 100%. We'll define what zero is and what 100% is uh, later on. Um, and what I want to know and understand, like how good are the competitors that I'm trying to um, compete with or rank uh, better than they are uh, at these levels? How good is their technical SEO? How good is their content? How many content pieces they have? Um, how many links they have? Are they like authoritative, relatively good and, and relatable um, uh, links or just like spam all over the world? Uh, so here's a level of the competitors you want to outrank. If you look at the top 10 pages in Google because you want to get to the first page of Google, then your competitors are the industry average of the top 10. If you want to get to the top three, uh, then your competitors are the pages or the domains ranking in the top three. The next step is, we'll talk about how to, how to tackle this one. Uh, the next is this level is very different based on country, based on topic. Um, and here's an example of banking and finance in my country in Hungary. Like um, content is good, off page is good. Technical SEO is not always the best or it's not perfect. But you see that having a lot of links is crucial and essential to rank in the money and finance uh, space um, in my country and pretty much anywhere else. If I look at a local dentist, a local dentist needs an okay website, let's say a WordPress site, a few links, let's say a handful, five, 10, 15, but that local dentist needs um, content. So that website would rank. If I look at the same market, like a dentist, but not like a local dentist in, in a small uh, town or small area, but in the capital, let's say in Budapest or, or Bratislava, the level of, uh, of their um, um, SEO values will be much higher. Now, if I look at the industry average, I want to look at myself and that's going to be the green one on the screen, which is my SEO level. So I can see how I am comparing to everybody else. Um, and my job in the very beginning, when I try to advise clients or when I want to tackle a new market or a new industry, I want to look at the red line, where is everybody else? The green bar, where is me? And I want to compare my competitors to myself or my competitors to the client I'm working with. Now, and once you understand this, you know where you can or where you should focus your efforts and your time on. Right now, at this, I need to focus on technical SEO because I see there is a gap. My site, let's say it's evident, but it's not mobile friendly or the website is very, very low, or the, the code base is, is horrible, terrible. There are like canonical tags are like a disaster. I need to fix these ones before actually moving on uh, to any other elements. So I can work on the technical optimization. Even if my content is better, I can write more and better content, even if I'm ahead, because it will maintain and then actually um, uh, make my lead a little bit more, uh, a little bit harder to achieve by everybody else. Because what would happen if I raise the bar, my bar very high up, it means that everybody after me would need to catch up um, to outrank uh, me. And of course, when you're talking about uh, off-page SEO, you need to get more and you need to get better links. Okay, this sounds super simple, but there must be something like like deep to this and then uh, 
let's show the, the cool stuff. Uh, we'll get there, but before we do that, we need to make sure that we understand the basics uh, well enough. Let's see, case number one. We identified that this is the case. Industry average, the red line is, as you see it on the screen, um, the green levels are slightly above, so I have a little bit better technical um, SEO, better website. I have more content, a little bit more, a little bit better. I have a few more links than everybody else. So in general, I would assume that in the long run, I would outrank them. It doesn't mean that I don't need to do SEO. It means that I'm roughly somewhere where they are at this exact moment. Of course, as they are working on their website, they will start to raise the bar. So what I need to do is I need to think ahead and start working. What do I do here? Where do I focus? If this is the setting, for me, it's very clear that I wanna start uh, writing more and better content. Why is this the case? Because at this level, my website should already be ranking for a lot of terms and content is something I have the most control on. I sit down, I write the content, or I tell somebody to sit down and write the content. And this will have the biggest impact on my SEO success, writing more content in this case. So I need to do keyword research, content audit, optimize old articles, write new pieces, everything that's related to content. I wanna focus on that one in this case. Why? Because we are already ranking and then tackling more keywords, more topic, topics will make the most uh, sense. Case number two, what happens in this case? Like we see the red levels, we see the green levels. It's very obvious that there is a gap in the links between everybody else and myself. I need to close this gap. I need to focus on building links. It could be guest posts, PR articles, mentions, partner sites, outreach campaigns, do what it takes to get more and better links because that's where we are lacking compared to everybody else. Case number three, what we have here, technical SEO is kind of lacking um, in the back. Um, so what we need to do is fix all the technical SEOs and the technical mistakes that we have um, on our website. We need to get to the same level or close to the same level as everybody else. So we need to fix the tech problems and the technical debt that we have. We need to get to the minimum level to be able to rank. This could be a migration to a new CMS sometimes. Um, and I know it's painful, but this is sometimes what I advise clients that have a very old website that it's a nightmare to update. Uh, or it could be fixing the website structure. It could be migrating to a mobile friendly template. It could be fixing uh, speed issues, whatever that is, you need to identify that first and then work on that one. In most cases, the actual situation obviously will be a combination of these three elements. Um, but if you fix all these, you maximize the chance of, of actually catching up to others and then ranking better than they are. But this can take months or sometimes even years. Um, so this is case number four. Um, I usually get this like, hey, we have good content. Our technical SEO is fine. We're probably not good enough in terms of links. We know that, we see that, what do I need to do? Well, you need to reach the minimum level of links in order to, re in order to rank for like those keywords that you are actually going after. Um, and the competition will dictate the number you need to reach and not you. So if they have 30 links and you have five, it means that you have a gap of 25. And this is what we're gonna take a look at uh, very uh, quickly. Um, uh, but before we do that, this is the last piece of like um, entry level knowledge that we need to know. So when we go forward, we don't step on any landmines. So when we're talking about links, there are two critical elements, authority and relevance. Authority, most of you know it from the domain authority uh, score from Moz way back. Right now, a lot of companies are using the DR, the domain rating values uh, from uh, HREFs. Uh, other companies are using SCM Rush data. Sometimes companies use uh, Majestic SEO data. It doesn't really matter. Uh, back in the day, Google used to have the, the page rank value. It all boils down to some tool will assign authority on a zero from 100 scale, a certain value to your website or to every other website. And that is supposed to 
show you how authoritative a website is. Relevance, on the other hand, is something a little bit different. Uh, you could have a very authoritative website, but at the same time, it, it is not even relevant. Like my website is very relevant in terms of SEO and my company's website, but it's not relevant in dog breeding or cat food uh, at all. It's authoritative, it's relevant, but not in every single topic. And as we move forward and take a step, we can divide this into high authority, low authority, high relevance and low relevance. And when it comes to links, we can identify four plus one sections in this. Low authority, low relevance, L-A-L-R. High authority, low relevance, low authority, high relevance, and then high authority, high relevance. These are the four elements we have. Let's take a look at the first one. Very low authority, very low relevance. These are usually real actual sites. These are not spam websites. This is important. Uh, maybe they are just very fresh and new, one or two years old. They rarely get updated or have very few links. Uh, like a personal blog, like my personal blog or like any SEO, other, uh, SEO professionals blog will be kind of like this one. They, they, they publish two articles a year because they don't have time. They have to work on clients. Uh, they have a few links, but they don't have time to work on it. It's not a spam website, but it's low authority, low relevance. Spam is something very different. We have to like avoid spam, but that's outside this box. Now we have low authority, high relevance. That's the top right corner. And then high authority, low relevance, which means that um, these are two segments. Most of your links will come from sites like this. Let me give you an example. A very high authority website, but with low relevance is like a big news outlet in your country. It's authoritative. A lot of people know about it. A lot of people like link to it, but it might not be like the crypto mining uh, powerhouse in that country. They wrote two articles and then one links to you, but in terms of crypto, it's not that uh, relevant. On the other hand, there will be websites which are super relevant, high relevance, but they don't have links like a website of a doctor who knows his craft or her craft. A lot of good information is there, but they have no idea how to get links from those uh, or to those pages because they are not link builders. They are not SEO professionals. And of course, high authority, high relevance, that's on the, on the top corner. Uh, these are the absolute best ones, uh, but they can cost a fortune or a lifetime to get featured and then get a link from those. Uh, these are the order of the links, or I could, uh, or I should call them Harry Potter and the order of links. The number one is high, high, high authority, high relevance. And then the second best one is low authority, but high relevance. The third best option is when authority is high, but relevance is low, and you want to leave uh, like the low, low section at the very last, and then try to avoid uh, spam at all. Question, at least to myself, when I was discovering this one, why is relevance more important than authority? So why is that website has to be about the same top, being about the same topic, dog, dog, means a lot more than a new site uh, which has no connection with dogs linking to me. Why is the dog-dog combination better than the new site with no dog but more authoritative linking to me? The reason behind that one, uh, it's kind of a, a statement from myself. So it's not like official Google statement, uh, but it's very easy to fake authority. Um, and I'm gonna show you how you can spot the fake authority with a few tools, or at least my favorite tool that I'm using. So this is um, a website in my, in my country. The website or the domain doesn't even matter. What we see here is like a couple of elements at the top. You see that the domain rating of the website is 12. This domain is supposedly having uh, 53 referring domains. So 53 other websites are pointing to this one, calculates into a DR of 12, but it gets one traffic a month, which is like, it, it doesn't get any traffic. So it has links, it has not a zero DR, but it has no traffic. Uh, it means that something is not right with that website. It's, it doesn't mean that it's trash, but like my little light bulb or the alarm uh, goes off here. Let's look at another one. This has a very high DR, like 53. It has over 300 referring domains, but at the same time, the organic traffic is 134. 
that's not like very good. Let's put it that way. Let's compare it to something else. Here's a different website. Well, this is actually my agency's website. It has a very similar DR rating, 53 compared to 48. Roughly the same. Referring domains, 337 compared to 328. So it's like the 300s, the 50s. But organic traffic on one hand is 100 and then 20,000. What do we see here? It's like based on two numbers, like referring domains and then DR rating, these websites look identical. But when, it turn, when we turn to the actual potential traffic that they are driving organically, there's a huge difference between these two. My first take is the, the site at the top, I think that's low authority and might even be spam. So if I would have the opportunity to choose, where do I get a link from? I don't look at DR because that could be fake. I look at organic keywords. I look at organic traffic because if a website can rank itself, it cannot be trash, it cannot be spam in terms of um, Google's algorithm. That's a very important message. So. What do we see here? DR53, but only 100 monthly traffic. Then the authority of this website is pretty, 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 I'm pretty sure that it's fake. So if a site can rank for many keywords and drive good organic traffic, that site is relevant and authoritative uh, enough to rank, then Google's algorithm thinks that it's relevant and authoritative. So that's like your number one check when it comes to links. Why do we need to know all this? The reason, because most tools are getting pretty good, but at the same time, pretty bad at helping us sometimes. And even my beloved Ahrefs. It's not like a bash on Ahrefs. That's my number one SEO tool that I'm using. Um, but there are a couple of mistakes that like, you can run into if you don't know well enough how the, the tool calculates a few numbers. This is the SEO's RAS website. Um, and it says that it has 62 referring domains. So let's say I want to outrank SEO's RAS or like somebody in this space. Do I need 60 links really? And then what you need is you click on that 62 and then uh, in the link type section, you just try to uh, boil down to follow or do follow links. And you'll see that, okay, it's, it's 40 do follow links and then 22 or 21 no follow links. So it's not 60 anymore, it's just 40 that I would need to recreate. And then I can go through the list, let's say 10, 15 are very good links because they are high authority and high relevance. So I need to dig deeper in order to understand the, the numbers or the meaning behind the numbers. Why is this important? Because here only two thirds of the links are actually follow or do follow, one third of it is no follow. It's not even that bad of a ratio. Um, two weeks ago, when I was doing a research, Ahrefs told me that this website has uh, 37 referring domains. And when I drilled deep enough, I found that pretty much only six of those 37 links were actually useful. They were not spam websites. They were not like copycat and then uh, websites. They were not no follow. Six links were good enough links. And that's my base and that's my point. I want to reference in that chart that I showed you with the red and the, and the green bars. Um, so here only 16% of the links uh, were good links or I consider good links. And this is why I'm saying that Ahrefs is really helpful because it will show you the data. But at the same time, if you only look at the top level, it can like disorient you in a bad way because you would see a high number. And then if you don't understand what's below or beneath that, it can throw you off track and then show you like not good data. Once again, why do we need to know all this? Because you need to understand the SEO levels of others so you know where you stand. Just like getting information from random tools and then, oh, their paid speed is like 58. We need to beat that one. I often get that one like, hey, I need a website, a web shop that paid speed score is above 90. And I'm like, Okay, but let's look at who are the competitors. Okay, these are your five competitors. Who is the best in terms of paid speed? Ah, they have 72. Then why do you want 90 or 95? Like, it is clear that you can rank with a paid speed of 75. Then why do you want to shoot way above that one? You can, that's fine. I just need to understand the logic because the time and money you put into that paid speed is not going to turn that much of a profit. I would probably put that into content or links or something else. So you need to understand where everybody else is 
in where you are. Why do I need to know this? Because this was the actual situation that I was seeing. Like, okay, is it like, do the others have six good links or 37 good links? It matters a lot because I can get six links in probably a few days and weeks, but getting 37 good links will take probably a year for a client. So when I need to predict the success of SEO, what do I need to know? Like how much work I need to put in where everybody else is standing, I need to catch up to them. And once I do that and I do good work, my belief is that I will actually have better SEO and better like results than what they have. So predicting SEO success is hard, but not impossible. When the competition is very low and the numbers are, are relatively low, it's very easy to like get these values. Uh, but as the competition rises, it's going to be like even the research work will be like it, it will take much more time uh, to go through that one. Um, I picked um, a Slovakian um, company just to give you an idea on not just links, but on content as well. So if you don't know, Etu is I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, they produce like mobile phone cases or like it's a web shop that sells mobile phone accessories. Let's put it that way. Um, and over here, uh, this is a screenshot from Ahrefs. Uh, you could see on, on, on row three that they have a blog and in their blog, Ahrefs reports that they have 154 uh, blog posts. If I type in, um, that's row number three, I didn't highlight it, but you can probably see it on the screen, uh, slash blog, it has pages 154, 154. Okay. Let's uh, Google search this folder in, um, in, in Google, like site at tool.sk slash blog. It says it has uh, 234, uh, 234 results, uh, which contains this uh, part of the uh, URL. Uh, they're kind of the same, like 150, 230. Uh, that's okay. Let's settle for 150. So let's say I'm competing with this website. They have 150 blog posts written. How many do I have? 30. It means that my rule of thumb gap is 150 minus 30. That's going to be 120 blog posts. Okay. In theory, I need to write 110 blog posts to catch up to where this company is actually standing. Awesome. This is my level, the green one, the red one, they are at 150. I already know the gap that I need to close. Okay, let's say I'm short of uh, 60 links because they have 60 more referring domains, good, good links, not just like spam links, good links. And they are ahead of us, at, let's say with 120 content pieces. I need to close this gap, 60 links, 120 blog posts. Do the math. If I want to get where they are in one year, that's 12 months, it means that I need to divide divide 120 with 12, that's gonna be 10, posts, 10 blog posts a month. And then it's gonna be 60 divided by 12. So it's gonna be five links every single month. Let's turn it into weeks. It's gonna be more than a link every single week. And then two to three content pieces every single week. Whoa, that's a lot of work. You would need like a full-time person to do this or like an agency with enough resources to do that. Good. It's hard to predict, but not impossible. And once you're actually starting to get the work on, as you're working, you'll start to see the results because the content and the links are kicking in. And then your search traffic and search console or analytics will go like this and not like this. Okay, so how do we need this or how do, how do we go through this process? Step number one, you list your competitors. You can ask for competitors from a client or you know by hand uh, or by yourself, or you can look at uh, competing domains using Ahrefs, Moz, SEMrush, whatever tool you use. So you don't take for granted what the client says because they might know their competitors, but it doesn't mean that those competitors are the best ones in terms of SEO. So your competitors are who are outranking you for the terms you want to rank for. Number two, you look at the SEO values. You could use Ahrefs, SEMrush, Moz, Google Tools. We can discuss in, in, in Slido what I'm personally using. In most cases, I look at if at a very basic good links and number of good content that ranks 
and brings in traffic. Ahrefs, SEMrush, or Moz will help you um, analyze all these elements at one place. We compare the levels in step number three. So where they are, where we are, the red line, the green one, and then you identify the right level. You're looking for quality, not just quantity. So it's not like, oh, we need 100 links um, because we might need 20 good links and then 20, 30 okay-ish links. That's still like a valid structure or a valid plan going forward. Step number five, you plan the work. Let's say you divide the raw numbers, the gap that you need to close by the required months to get there. If you need 12 links to get up to where everybody else is standing or your top competitors who are outranking you, if you want to close this gap, you need 12 links. You're doing that in a year. It means 12 divided by 12. That's one link in every single month. That's your take on it. But be aware it doesn't take into consideration that the other company or competitor is also working. So this space will help you to get where they are at this exact moment. And once we go through all this, uh, that's when you can actually start seeing results. So what if we don't have this level of resources? A client might ask. So I don't, I, I cannot like write two content pieces every single week and get a link every month. Uh, well, it's kind of hard to swallow and then it's, I know it's hard to digest, but then you can't guarantee success then. Like the numbers are there. I know it's rather mathematical how you predict how much work you need to put in, but this is your best chance and your best like, like opportunity to show yourself, your client, existing client or your potential client that this is the work you need to put in. And I'm gonna show you one more thing uh, because that's where it all boils down to. So doing a little bit of SEO, probably not gonna make a lot of sense. Of course, if competition is like zero in that market, like very little SEO is gonna be better than no SEO. But if you do little SEO and others are doing big SEO, then they're gonna win the long run. So here's, this is the last, a slide in the presentation uh, that has actual content on it. Uh, not this one, but how I'm building it up. So this is real data from the Hungarian market and a couple of um, um, parts, industries, let's call them industries um, and how they're comparing. So a few industries, a dentist, gardening, website development, money and insurance, um, home decor, uh, house building, whatever you call it. So when you find the contractor and whoever builds or renovates your house. And then I looked at their um, estimated organic traffic. The data comes from Ahrefs. Uh, how many content pieces they have. I use the site search uh, with, uh, with, with Google. Uh, how many quality links they have. It's very important. It's not the raw number of links in Ahrefs, but I drill down. I look at these one by one and then try to understand how many good links you actually need. The number of months to require to catch up, it's like, what you would see like my estimate that's that's a good way to put it like is it like a year two years three years to catch up to where everybody else is standing and what is the estimated total budget in terms of, of like if i would need to do it how much would it cost to to get there um so let's say a good dentist in hungary would get like twenty thousand organic traffic a month uh, maybe 30 uh you could go up to that high you need about 40 45 content pieces 25 good quality links you can do this in in a year in 12 months i would say two years but it's possible to do it in one year and this is how much it would cost like over 10,000 euros uh, just to get all the content pieces and the links and everything in one pack. If you want to buy it in one package, this is roughly how much it would cost. Gardening, like a small one. This is how many traffic you would get, how many content pieces you would need to write, quality links, how much time it would take and how much money it would uh, be required to do this. Website development, same money and finance. See the numbers are way higher than the, the ones before. You need over 400 quality domains in the Hungarian market to rank for these terms, uh, like the money and insurance uh, and, uh, 
of other types of uh, keywords um, and the price is like 10 times higher than, um, than let's say with the dentist, uh, local dentist market, house building and so on. So what you, what you could do is look at your market and then just get a feeling of this one. It's very important. Like this is what we see here as based, this data is based on the top three websites in that industry uh, with the average uh, values. Because if I want to rank something, I want to rank these in the top three. If a client asks you, I know it's a, a strange ask, we want to rank on the first page of Google. That's perfectly okay for us at the moment. Your competition is not number one, number two, number three, but um, ranking seven, eight, nine, and 10, because you're competing with those ones and let's say with position 11. It's important because sometimes ranking in the top three is like way, way higher, uh, like for the competition to rank there is way higher than ranking at the bottom of top 10. So this is the framework that I, I try to come up with. And these are the numbers I try to come up with, like tech, content, links, how much time and how much effort I need to put in. Um, and now, now I know how much work I need to put in to get to the top of uh, Google. Um, there was some actual advice in that. I know some of this for you were not that deep into SEO. It's still like, okay, but how do I do that? What do I do? Uh, but this was the SEO magician crash course in the very beginning. So you now understand the framework. And if you have specific questions, I, uh, I saw that some of you posted them on, on Zoom. Please go to Slido because we're going to go through all the questions with Daniel uh, right over there. And of course, if you will have questions after the session, uh, you can write me an email at that email address not yet outsourced to India. So I myself will be answering when, when I have time and everything else. So I guess, Daniel, please take over with Slido and screen sharing. Um, Thank you. That, that Thank helps you, a Gabo. lot. Thank and you, then, Gabo, for your presentation. Very interesting. I think we have four questions, but um, I think all those are mostly asking the same thing. So okay. you have shown us the numbers that you are taking from Ahrefs. Those are for links, link quality, and then you also check the organic traffic, uh, which you uh, and the content which you verify through Google search. And uh, Jana is asking also, how do you evaluate the values for technical uh, issues pillar? So that's, that's a tricky one because what I do is I fire up Screaming Frog um, and I do a, a crawl of the website and I have um, five, six, like what I do, like this, is, this is how I work. Uh, when, I, when I try to understand whether there is something wrong technically, you need to go into Search Console and see if there is something like, like flashing alarming that something is way off. That's one way of looking at the competitors or the, the client's um, um, website health, let's put it that way. Second one, I look at um, Screaming Frog, uh, the client itself. Do I see any major technical problems with that one? If the technical foundation is good enough, it doesn't have to be outstandingly good. There just, there shouldn't be any big mistakes like no index pages, bad canonicalization, if the basics are fine, I'm not I'm usually not that worried about like page speed and then all these elements. What many people are missing, like, okay, you fire up, you look at the website, look it on mobile to see if the website looks good on mobile, works on mobile. So I, in terms of technical elements, let's put it that way, I usually go through my checklist of technical elements rather than like, who page speed score. I don't think I've ever checked it like on my site, like very regularly, like I need to be at like 90. No, I just kind of need to be in the same ballpark as everybody else is. Um, so in terms of technical SEO, I look at search console for the client. If there are any major mistakes, I look at screaming frog. What can usually help is if you're working with um, um, a relatively, let's say, random CMS, like a content management system that you've never heard of, you've never seen. For me, that's usually a red flag. Like, I don't know what this is. It's not, let's say, Magento. It's not WordPress. It's not the Shopify. It's something locally brewed, but 
ooh, that's that's usually not a good sign. If everybody else, let's say, is using WooCommerce or Shopify, then that's usually like. I hope it answered the question. Technical elements are very hard to compare because different CMSs do different things. They work differently. Focus on the client, Search Console, Screaming Frog, checklist of elements. There shouldn't be anything that's like a major issue. Um, and that's the that that's where I stand. That's, um, in that I, sense. I, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned Screaming Frog because we use it as well. And I think it's a good evaluation tool just to get also the overview of the industry of the of the competitors pages, because you can get lots of uh, good big picture data about their Absolutely, own, absolutely. About like their one own. thing, one thing that's not specifically technical, but I usually um, do is I look at how many pages a competitor has, not just like the blog, but how big is the website? Because if my competitor has a hundred pages, as I showed you before, like the very uh, like flashy uh, picture in the beginning, like technical elements and content, if a site is small, technical issues will not be that important if everything is fixed. If you go above like, let's say 50,000 uh, indexed pages, Technical issues matter a lot more over there compared to 200 index pages on a WordPress website. All right. I do a light audit in 15, 20 minutes, and then just move on to on page and off page. All right, thank you. It's a very good answer. And I, this is this is maybe a tricky question. If if you have maybe compiled some industry average rates when you were doing it for your client, or do, do you recommend some other websites where? Uh, Matej can can uh, look for these numbers. I don't think that, like I myself haven't seen anything in English uh, with this one, uh, but quite frankly, it's not that hard to do. Like, I know it sounds easy because I do this on a regular basis, but like just plug the the three big competitors into Ahrefs, look at how much like how many links do they have, and then um, how much traffic they are driving and then look at how many content pieces they have in Google. For three companies doing this with, with an HF's account, it takes about 10 minutes, five minutes. Um, and then you have roughly of understanding how it works. I don't think there's an open source or like a public website with this data or this information. Uh, there might be, if somebody knows, put it in the comments. I haven't found any, so that's why I was putting together this one for myself yeah, we, we uh, usually just work with data from multiple sources that we have to compile so exactly uh, yeah i don't think there is there is something like this uh ready ready to be used and how do you or how, how often do you update the number of competitors or not just the numbers but like the values for the three pillars do you do you do some seo work and then maybe in half a year you come back to this uh, evaluation or how, how often do you work with this evaluation? That's a good question because uh, I often wonder this about myself, like, do I need to update this or don't, or like updating this once a year um, actually makes sense because it means that you see if anybody else catches up, if anybody else goes down, if they are getting links at a very high, or they just like started link building. So updating their numbers is important, but monitoring those who you just like did the data and the research on is more important. Like I usually, every two or three months, I look at the data of the companies I did the research on. So the competitors of my website, the competitors of my client, why do I need to know that? Because if one year passes by, I haven't done anything and they built like 30% more links than I did, I need to do that. And that one year is uh, already behind me. So updating the numbers once a year, um, following what everybody else is doing is um, one or two months. My trick in the book is, um, I have an HRFs account, a paid account, and then I have competitors uh, backlink report um, on a weekly basis. Right. So every single week I get an email, uh, whether a competitor built any new link, a new referring domains was added uh, to their website. 
Um, that's something you could do. Um, and also what you could do is set up a Google alert um, with another website index. The way you do that is you set up an alert with the site to dot competitor.com. And if you put this in a Google alert, what this will do, it will send you only the new content pieces that come out on a website. So if another competitor is posting a new blog post, um, a, a job posting or whatever, you get an email, let's say every single week about that one, which means that I don't have to update the numbers because every single week I'm reminded by new content they published and new links they got. If I don't get anything, I don't need to do anything because they haven't done anything. So the rate, the level, what they have, the red one is not going up. Awesome. However, it doesn't mean like I'm not tracking like new competitors entering that market. So you have to be careful. Uh, I have to look at it, but like, you know, that those are the three big ones, no new content, no new links. Thank you. I'm completely fine because they are not doing anything. Right. So let's talk about results as well. Um, I think clients often ask us uh, some to, to give us some prediction or estimates of what numbers we can bring. I think you did a good job on uh, estimating the budget for the customers. What, what, what about results? What about what, what kind of metrics do you work with in terms of uh, clients uh, uh, um, questions or predicting numbers for clients? Like we often, for example, hear questions like can you i don't know build us 10 links a month or 15 links a month or 30 links a month how do you maybe work with this that clients somehow come with this concept that they need to get enough links built but we know that it's not only about the links as you have shown in your three pillars so how do you work with the pre predictions of of numbers so the way I work with this one, I try to, I always try to um, get some data that I understand and I can rely on. It's important to not just like get some random data and show it to a client like, hey, this is it, this is what you need. But um, if we go back to HRFs, they have two uh, charts uh, that are important. One chart is, uh, referring domains over time like how does that graph look they had 10 referring domains five years ago and then it was 20 it was 30 it was 65 and right now it's 100 i see the graph of how many links new refer and and, and when i'm talking about links i'm always talking about referring domains like you could get a thousand links from one domain but it's let's let's say that's one link so how many referring domains they have over time you have this graph and then what is their uh, estimated or budgeted uh, organic traffic? Does it compare to each other? Like they had zero organic traffic five years ago and it was starting to go up. Right now I see that within a time frame of five years, they went from zero to 20,000 organic traffic and from zero links to a hundred links. Okay, if you do that, the same thing in five years, nobody else does anything, you get kind of the same place where they are right now. And when you try to like shorten that um, uh, time frame, let's say one year, I see what they did in a year and how fast, how far they got. And that's my understanding. Okay, their budgeted uh, or like estimated organic traffic is 20,000. My traffic is 3,000. So there's a gap of 17,000 we can tackle. Okay, clients, we can tackle probably 17,000 more organic traffic, but to get here, we need 110 posts and then 50 links. Ooh, way too much. We don't have budget for that one. No problem. Let's get down a little bit. Let's find somebody else in that space who has, let's say, an organic traffic of 7,000, 8,000, 10,000. You want to get, if you want to get there, this is how much work we need to put in. So when you see someone very high up, a lot of traffic, a lot of links, cool. They're like five years ahead of us. Let's find somebody else who is a little bit below and we can catch up to those people. And what I would show a client is that this is the ideal scenario. You have unlimited budget and time. We can get here within a year, but we need to put this much and this much and then do that one. Um, if you can't do that, I don't have resources. I try to find somebody who's below that one. And the client says, we have 
this much budget. I tried, okay, that's like four posts a month and then two links. Four posts and two links will put us to this much content, this many links. Is there anybody else out there who is at that level that I can reach? If so, that's kind of where we can get to um, in the long run. If we talk about values or like, like just, to, just to, to, to sum it up, I don't aim for position or ranking. So if somebody has, somebody says, I want to rank number two or number one, I say, good luck, find somebody who can like, like guarantee that one for you. Because I myself, I only work in SEO. I myself cannot even guarantee to myself that I can rank my website for that keyword because anything can happen. An algorithm update, technical issues, somebody else is better than me. Um, and right now I have a website. It was ranking for four years, number one. Nothing has changed. And it was dropped to position eight. And I was like, what the hell? Then I didn't do anything. And it went back to position number three and I didn't do anything. And for four years, Google had no problem with that website ranking number one. And then it went down, it goes up. And right now I'm, I'm actually curious what is going to happen because I'm just losing my guarantee yeah. against myself because I can guarantee my ranking. Well, well, thank you. Thank you, Gabor. This was Gabor Papp from The Pitch. And thank you for uh, participating today. Thank you for every, uh, for, to everybody for participating as well with your questions and following us. Don't forget that you will have this video available at YouTube at our channel. So just follow us uh, there or follow our social networks. And this is not the last webinar in SEO's REST uh, this year. So uh, we'll have more guests and we will be happy to see you there then. Thank you again and bye-bye. Bye-bye.